Hello friends, I'm the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurk. It is Westminster Wednesday today, so it's time for another exploration of what's actually in the Westminster Confession of Faith. You may know that the Church of Scotland holds the Westminster Confession as our subordinate standard, which means that it is subordinate to scripture. It is lower down than scripture, less important than scripture, but still a standard, meaning that we are to subscribe to it, to, um, to discuss and to think about and to hold as the sort of ruler of our faith um, this confession, which is a document that says what we believe, what we think that scripture teaches us. Um, so the Westminster Confession was, of course, written by a group of mostly English theologians with a handful of Scottish theologians thrown in in 1646. In 1647, the Church of Scotland adopted it, but the Church of England never did, actually, or at least not for long. So this document that was meant to bring us together, to unite the churches of this island as one um, under one theological umbrella uh, didn't. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. But we have continued to subscribe to it very literally. Um, ministers, elders, and deacons are asked to sign it to say that this is what we believe, that we think it is an accurate understanding of scripture. Um, and the way that we talk about that is to say that the Church of Scotland holds as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith, recognizing liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine as do not enter into the substance of the faith. Now that sentence about liberty of opinion on such matters as do not enter into the substance of the faith was actually added in because of some disagreements with some of the bits we're going to read today. Now, later on, even after that was added, in the 1980s, the General Assembly declared that we no longer hold several points within the confession, all related to the Roman Catholic Church. So when this was written in the 17th century, um, there was quite a lot of language we would now consider inflammatory about the Roman Catholic Church. And the Church of Scotland has declared by an act of the assembly that we do not hold to those parts. But some of these other parts, including some of today's bit, um, there is a wide disparity of opinion, although the majority over the last 200 years or so have come down on the side of one section in particular not being entirely supportable by scripture. So we'll talk more about that when we get to it. But today we're going to talk about chapters two and three, which are about um, God, about what God is like, basically. Um, and then next week we'll be able to talk about what God does. <laughs> so um, here we are. This is one of the most interesting ways to describe God I think I have ever heard. So I'm just going to read you the first paragraph of chapter two, which is titled, Of God and of the Holy Trinity. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body parts or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty." One sentence, that's what we've got, one sentence. So this description of God includes lots of words we would still use today, right? We talk about God being most holy, most wise, most loving, gracious, merciful. All of those are still the way we describe God because of course that's biblical language. Um, some of it is a little bit confusing to us. It sounds strange now to talk about um, like the word immutable 
<laughs> doesn't get used much in English anymore. But what it means is unchanging, right? That immutable means it's it's sort of a physics word now. Uh, it can't be changed from the outside, like can't be acted upon in a way that changes its substance. Um, and then we have this <laughs> ending that says, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And then at the end it says, who will by no means clear the guilty? So that might feel a little bit like a contradiction in terms, the idea that God is um, most gracious, loving, merciful, abundant in goodness, forgiving, but won't clear the guilty. And part of the reason that God is talked about this way is to maintain two aspects of the nature of God that we see really clearly in scripture. And one of those is God's love, right? God is love. And throughout the Old and the New Testament, we see the love of God expressed in a lot of different ways. And the other aspect of God is sometimes called God's justice. But justice used in a, not in the biblical sense because biblical justice is about turning the systems of the world upside down. But justice in this sense means um, more like judgment, God's freedom to judge in ways that humans are not entitled to judge, according to Jesus. Um, and so the love and the judgment of God are held in, in this sort of tension. It's like they pull like this. And that's exactly what this paragraph is trying to get at in all of these big words, right? So God is loving and merciful and forgiving and also um, will by no means clear the guilty. Now, we use those words differently today to talk about who is guilty, for instance. Um, and later on in the confession, it will become clear that in the minds of the people who wrote this, every human being is guilty. And so it's difficult then to start um, untangling exactly what that might mean in the 21st century and how it relates to our practice of um, confessing our brokenness and our sinfulness and the mistakes that we make um, and our commitment to turning and going and into God's way, right? To repent means to turn around. And if it's all very complex in that way, but, um, but that's what this paragraph is trying to do is to hold together these seemingly opposite ways of thinking about God into one God because God is incomprehensible, which is probably a word they ought to have used, frankly. Um, they went with, oh, they did use incomprehensible. Immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, and most wise. So bigger than our, even our imaginations, like our language cannot contain what God is like. And that's part of why there are so many words in this paragraph. In the second paragraph about God, um, my favorite bit of this is aside from, if, from saying that God is alone in and unto himself all sufficient. So not needing the creation, but choosing to make the creation. Um, it has this phrase that says about the creatures which God hath made. It says, God does not derive any glory from them, from the creation, but manifests his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. So God's glory is manifested in the creation, by the creation, to the creation, and upon the creation. So in every possible way, from both within and without, out with, we might say in Scotland, <laughs> um, the glory of God can be seen, revealed, and received by the creatures that God has made, which the confession mostly means us, human beings. It has in view more humanity than the rest of creation because it's the 17th century, but it will hold for the whole of creation. Imagine God revealing God's glory to the trees, we see God's glory in the changing of leaves, for instance, or in um, the sunsets that we get here. But 
do we ever think about God revealing God's glory to the hills, to the river, to the dolphins? Maybe not. I think it's interesting to think about the glory of God and how we recognize it and how God chooses to manifest it in, by, unto, and upon us. So I, I love that phrase, um, and I think it's something we don't think about much. So I just want to lift that out to you all. The third paragraph basically just says, we believe in the Trinity. It's super short. It's very strange. It just says God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And that there, um, it's not exactly a hierarchy, but that the Father has begotten the Son and that the Spirit is, is eternally proceeding from both the Father and the Son. So it's not a triangle exactly, and it's but it's not um, a line either. So this is a sentence that has gotten Protestants into trouble with the Orthodox, or Catholics into trouble with the Orthodox for that, for that matter, um, since the year about a thousand, um, when the idea that the Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son was added to the Nicene Creed, and the Orthodox churches um, don't agree with that. They say only from the Father. So um, that's a whole other part of church history, but I just want to note that the confession is explicit about our Trinitarian theology and that um, the substance, power, and eternity of all three persons of the Trinity are equal. And the fancy phrase for that is... Um, equal in power and co-equal in majesty. So there you have it. <laughs> now chapter three gets us into some trouble. Like so far we have in chapter two talking about what God is like. We haven't run into anything particularly difficult. Like we might still have some niggling questions about God who will by no means clear the guilty, but we could, we could get into that in a different way. But here we have a chapter about God's eternal decrees. So from the beginning of time, what God has been like and how God has chosen to interact with the world. And this is the chapter that gives us what is commonly called predestination. Now, when John Calvin wrote about predestination, he wrote about it only as being about... Um, our eternal salvation and predestination was meant to be good news because it would free us from having to earn our way into heaven. So the idea originally in the 16th century of predestination is that God has chosen who will be saved and it's not our business if we're saved or if that person is saved like we are supposed to act as if we are a part of God's chosen people we are to live in gratitude for the grace we have received and then when we come down to sort of eternal questions those are all in God's hands and out of human hands entirely what is in human hands according to Calvin is um, the making of the kingdom of God visible in our time. So that is the task of the Christian to bring about more and more um, glimpses of God's kingdom today. Now by the 17th century, people who studied the writings of Calvin took a slightly different view of what predestination might mean and they expanded that not just into um, who is saved but they decided that that also meant that God had chosen some people before the foundation of the world. Some people were chosen to be not saved or, or more bluntly to be sent to hell while the rest go to heaven. Um, that's called double predestination that God chooses for both directions. Single predestination is that God chooses for one direction, which sort of leaves open the question of what happens to anyone else but also leaves open the possibility that actually, as per the idea in scripture that there's no place where God is not, it leaves open the idea that 
um, God chooses everyone, right? We're supposed to have good hope for all, according to another confession that was written in Switzerland in the late 16th century, so about 80 years before the Westminster Confession. Um, but at Westminster, they went fully down the double predestination road. And so they have said um, that God has from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and, unchangeable, and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass, but God is somehow not the author of sin and violence is not done to the will of the creature. So we still have the will to behave in the ways that we wish. Um, and it goes to great lengths to say that even though God knows what is coming, God doesn't um, take away our ability to change what is coming, if that makes sense. So they're trying to retain some measure of free will um, in the matters of everyday life. In my opinion, they're failing at that, but we can discuss that another time when we get to the free will chapter, maybe. Um, and then it says, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. This sort of sentence is exactly why um, that business about liberty of opinion in matters that don't enter into the essentials of the faith was added to the ordination and induction and everything else language that we use in the Church of Scotland because this in the 19th century many Presbyterians decided was not supportable by scripture so it's just not it's not in there it, it's just not in there <laughs> so that's a tricky thing like to figure out where it came from um, and why that would become so important to say in 1646 as if that was in some way helpful to the cause of the kingdom of God in these aisles. Um, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. I wish I did because that sort of historical context might help, and I'm sure somebody has researched that, but I haven't been able to um, spend the time researching it myself. So here's what I know. <laughs> That's not said that clearly in the Bible anywhere, and it's very difficult to infer it from somewhere. And it's not what John Calvin said, and it's not what other confessions say. So when you follow this line down and you get into the rest of the chapter, what ends up happening is that the confession is forced to say, essentially, that Christ only died for who are called the elect. So Jesus didn't die and rise for everyone, but only for some whom God had chosen in advance. And the rest are just on their own forever. Uh, that really is not scriptural. It's just not. So that's a problem that, that we sign our names to this. But we all also do that, understanding that we have liberty of opinion in things that are not essential. And many of us would say that trying to believe this falls into non-essential. Now, I might actually say that believing this the way it's laid out here would be essential in the sense that it's essentially wrong. But um, I do have colleagues who would disagree. So it's good that we have this wide open opportunity for discussion. The very last paragraph of this chapter says, the doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care, that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may from the certainty of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election. So what they're trying to say is be careful, but also know that if you are a person who is called to read scripture and to be obedient to it, then you are one of the elect. So the way that you recognize your status, as it were, 
is because you see it in your faithfulness. Now, that is the exact opposite of the reason why John Calvin wrote about predestination, <laughs> because he didn't want us to be wondering who's in and who's out, or trying to prove who's in and who's out. He wanted us to be focused on living lives in response to God's grace, rather than focused on who goes to heaven. So this, these theologians from a hundred years after Calvin's writing really took him the wrong direction, the opposite direction of what he actually said. Um, because it's supposed to be good news that sets us free to live in response to grace, to be gracious because we have received grace, to love because we have been loved, to welcome others because we have been welcomed. So all of that is how we're supposed to be acting, which is in accordance with scripture. And then whatever happens after is not our business. We don't get to um, affect our own or anyone else's eternal salvation. We do get to affect how people experience grace and mercy and forgiveness and justice and love here and now. So this is a really difficult teaching. It's a very difficult chapter. Um, and, and it's hard to see how it applies to our 21st century lives, particularly since it's hard to see how it applied to their 17th century lives either. Um, I will say that there's this bit about how the elect, so the ones for whom Christ died in this um, framework will be the ones who come to faith and in the midst of that little section there's this bit about how that actually works and I do think that's helpful <laughs> so there's there's one redeeming clause in this entire chapter so it says in um Is it paragraph five? No. Six? Five. So we have this bit about how um, God has chosen before the foundation of the world and that the people who... Oh, it's six. So the people who are elect, who are, of course, sinful like everyone else, are called into faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season. So even those who are among the elect in this framework are still, their faith doesn't come from themselves. Their faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit that allows them to live faithfully now. And that is exactly what Paul says, um, right, in the book of Romans, that we come to faith by the work of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians as well, um, not through our own effort. So any effort that we make is already in response to God being at work in our lives. And that part is biblical, and the rest of the chapter is not so much. So um, we have some high, highlights and lowlights of the Westminster Confession today, and I hope that that has given you a little peek into some of the complicated workings of theologians and giving you things to think about as you think about who God is and what God is like, how God behaves in the world. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Like, what is God like for you? How would you describe God? What words would you use? And how do you think about how God is at work on a, on a cosmic salvation scale? And then next time we'll talk about how God is at work in a, an earthly scale. So I have had fun talking about this confession with you and I hope you have a great evening and a great week thinking about all these things. I would love to hear from you about your thoughts and until next week, um, peace be with you. <laughs>